So the, um, the thing that I'm going to try to talk about just to, it, to start with is managing moisture and uh, what we're doing in our system um, in, uh, I guess, in a changing climate. So the sorts of things I'm going to talk about is infiltration, so water going into the soil, the transpiration, so the water coming out but through the plant, evaporation, so water coming out but not through the plant, sounds pretty obvious. Cation exchange capacity. I think cation exchange capacity is a very poorly understood measure generally, um, but what it really means and how we can use that in, uh, in trying to understand our systems. Effectively, you can think about cation exchange capacity being the Velcro in the soil. Okay, so things like um, water and our nutrients are like the fluff. So in any given soil, like a clay, will have more of that Velcro. Okay, at some stage, the fluff's going to come in. The Velcro is going to start sticking to that fluff, but at some stage, that'll become saturated with fluff, and then more fluff will come in and it'll just drain off. Okay, when the plant wants to take the roots, want to extract that moisture, they're going to start pulling it off, but they'll never be able to get it all. Okay. Um, and then we'll talk about what non-plant available water is compared to plant available water and how drainage happens. The first thing I want to do though is that most of climate change stuff and a lot to do with farming systems actually happens at what they might call the molecular level. I don't want to get too fussed about it, but there's things called electrons and protons and all that sort of stuff that you may have heard of before. But what I want to do is just give you a bit of confidence that it's actually pretty easy to understand. Because most of us when we think about something like, this actually hasn't come up too well in the slide, but the sun and the earth going around it, it's exactly the same sort of way things work, except that the moon goes around the earth using gravity. Okay, so there's gravity between the moon and the earth, and the reason the moon just doesn't fly off into space is because there's an attraction there. Okay, it reaches in an orbit, and the reason it doesn't get sucked into the earth and crash into it is because it's moving at speed, like a yo-yo on the end of the string. So if you cut the string, it would fly off. Okay, basically gravity is the thing that's keeping that in an equilibrium and a balance. When we go down to the molecular world, it's exactly the same sort of stuff, it's just that instead of being gravity, it's electromagnetic attraction, so the north and south poles of magnets. Okay, that's all it is. And so, if we think about this, this element here called oxygen, which you would have heard before, it has its big planet in the middle, and then it just has a whole lot of negatively charged moons going around it effectively, so the planet itself is positive, and they're negative. Hydrogen, which you would have also heard of, is the simplest of all the elements. It has its positive centre with a negative charge going around it called an electron, but once again if we just think about that as a moon. When we get H2O, like water, basically these come together and the moons of the hydrogen basically circle the oxygen. And the reason for that is, is that oxygen is a much bigger planet, okay, it has a stronger positive charge. All right. So things like Jupiter have 70 moons or 100 moons, however many moons Jupiter has, whereas the Earth only has one. It's got to do with how, gra you know, how much gravity it's got, is how many moons it can capture. In the same way as this, oxygen is a big, you can think about oxygen being like a big planet, it wants to have a lot of negative charge around it, a lot of moons around it. And this becomes important later for understanding cation exchange. You notice though, is that these particular electrons here spend most of their time going around the, water, around the oxygen of the water and these positive charges on the hydrogen are left sort of sticking out, okay? Now if we were to map the electromagnetic surface of water, we would find around the oxygen, because the electrons are disproportionately spending more time there, it has a higher negative charge, but where those two protons, which are positively charged, are sticking out, is that that takes on a more of a positive charge. So water isn't a universal sphere, okay? It actually has ends to it, like a magnet does, okay? So if we start to look at that, and we've got our hydrogen with its bit of positive and our oxygen with a bit of negative, does everyone understand that, why that is, that, we, that it is not isn't uniform, that it actually has end? Is everyone comfortable with that? What can happen is that this positive charge can start to want to bind next door to this negative charge here. Okay, and now we're starting to get things to come together. So if you think about water as being like a million magnets in a bag, Okay, you can see how a million magnets in a bag would sort of flow out. You could almost pour those magnets out, but they'd sort of stick together. Okay, and you could put those million magnets into any shape you wanted. It would almost have a fluid-like character. And that's exactly what happens, is that that's just taking this out in three dimensions in every dimension. That's all the water is. It's a bunch of magnets sticking together. Okay, and that's, uh, and that's when in 
in heat, we, we measure heat, um, but it's actually called kinetic energy. And kinetic energy is, is how quickly something is vibrating. And water, you see, imagine those magnets, if they're vibrating really hard, so they're really hot, they find it hard to come together, and the shaking actually is what keeps them apart, keeps them fluid. But as they get cooler, they, they, they start to shake less, and they actually come together, and that's where we start to get things like solids formed, like ice. Their magnetic attraction is overtaking the shaking. But as we heat it up, they start to shake more, it starts to form a liquid again. We shake the hell out of it, it actually goes off as a gas. Okay, and that's, that's how steam's created. All right? Now, I just want to just go back to oxygen for a sec. Oxygen, we often think about as being oxygen in the air. Um, about 99.5% of the oxygen in the world is actually in rocks. And in chemistry, the ending of the word eight means saturated with oxygen. So nitrate is nitrogen, saturated with oxygen. Sulfate is sulfur, saturated with oxygen. Phosphate, phosphorus, saturated with oxygen. Silicate, silicon, saturated with oxygen. So silicate makes up all of our sand. And it's all got lots and lots of oxygen in it. So there's, there's, there's all this, a lot, a lot of oxygen that's actually in rocks. Remembering, of course, that it likes to have that negative charge around it, and that is what generates our cation exchange capacity. So if we look at the surface of a clay, here we have aluminium with oxygen attached to it. It could be silicon, aluminium, silicate, whatever. But the oxygen here is actually, again, stealing more than its fair share of electrons. And remember those moons are negatively charged. It actually brings a negative polarity to that surface. So in a, you know, the old textbooks you see soil colloid or clay, you know, it's got a little negative charge on it. Okay, That's actually how it's formed, simply because this is a big planet that wants to have those negative moons around it. And because it's got a higher density of negative charge around it, it has a negative polarity. That's it. Okay. What happens from there, though, is that the two positive bits of water come up and bind to that. Okay? So they start to stick to that. And if... I just grab these two bits of glass here. They're relatively dry-ish. Okay, there's no... If I pull that away, it falls, right? Now, this isn't too much of a magic trick. That's just a little bit of water. But if I add water to that, there's no dramas there. Okay? That's stuck. Right? And, if, and if you really get it really wet up and put it, you know, a lot together, it can get quite hard. That simply is that, anyone know what glass is? Silicon dioxide? Okay, it's just another silicate. It's got a lot of oxygen in it. It's got a lot of negative polarity in it. Okay, the water here is just lining up one there and one there. Okay, and it's like the little magnets are in there are keeping it together. So that's sort of looking at water in real life. What tends to happen when we get water coming through the soil, if I'm moving too fast, just say so, but uh, sort of a bit short on time, I've got a few things to get through. So if we imagine this being a real magnet, okay, and we stick our first bit of water on there, that can come and go, but it's actually pretty tough to get that first one off. And so our next bit of water comes along and the negative polarity on this end of the water sticks to the positive polarity there, and so forth. Okay, so we have one that's stuck to the cation exchange quite firmly, one that's a bit looser, and one that won't stick at all. Okay, so that, that charge, if you like, that density is, is actually being diminished through the longer the chain gets. And that's why we end up with drainage. Okay, so when that cation exchange gets full, we then get drainage. All right, now, um, there's a whole lot of implications for that, uh, but that's essentially is our water holding capacity of our soil and how easily it gives up water is basically directly related to how much of that negative polarity we have exposed, and that's what you get back when you get a cation exchange measure. Now, the cation exchange, for example, has really got to do with surface area. So if you think about one of those Rubik's cubes, a Rubik's cube is like a sand grain. And, and by definition, sands are quite coarse, and as you go through different soils to clays, they get more and more finer. Because it's smaller, it has more surface area. So if you get that Rubik's cube and bust it up into all its bits, you actually have a lot more surface area exposed. And that's why a clay can hold a lot more water. Okay? Now, organic matter. So when we build organic matter up, we also increase our water holding capacity. And the main reason is, is you see on this bit of 
humic acid here, and you would have heard of humates in soils, is that you see there's a lot of this C double bond O. And again, it's the old oxygen, okay, with its high electromagnetic potential, wanting to do the same sort of thing. So if we actually expand that out, we see carbon with oxygen here, another oxygen here, negative, negative, positive, positive. First thing, we have more polarity in the system, we start to have more water holding potential. So if you think about water like iron filings, and our organic matter like a magnet again, it's like dropping the magnet in iron filings, and the water's gathering around it in every direction. Okay, stringing off of it. Now, I want to sort of start moving on to how we actually look at um, the soil moisture in our farming systems and the type of decisions that we might be able to make from it. This is a pretty typical soil moisture graph where what we're looking at here is electronic sensors that simply send a signal out to the, out to the soil and it, depending on how much moisture is there, some of that signal will get absorbed. So when it's very dry, not much gets absorbed, so it comes back to the sensor, so it knows it's dry. If there's a lot of moisture in the soil, it gets absorbed by the moisture, not much comes back to the sensor, so the sensor says it's wet. Okay? There's a sensor here at 10 centimetres, at 20 centimetres, at 30 centimetres, so we're actually looking down through the soil profile. If the soil moisture at 10 centimetres goes up, the sensor changes its characteristics and this just graphs it. So we've got time going through here with a 10 centimetres wet, drying out, wetting, drying out. Does everyone understand what that graph is showing us? If you don't, just it's cool, I'm happy to say it again. Can we get a copy of these things? Or what? Yep. Oh, sure, no, don't, don't write anything. I've got, um, I can um, send it to, to Sarah. I did actually try to get it through, but it's uh, actually a bit of a big file on it and didn't get through. Well, there, um, just a question about um, with clay and organic matter. Yep. Which, um, you know, with clay, it, it will hold more water, but it will hang on to it tighter than sand. If you get more organic matter in sand, will it hold on to that water tightly or will it relinquish it as well? Uh, it's, it, 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 there is, depending on what um, other element is bonded to the oxygen, will have a slight influence on how tight that negative polarity is and therefore how strong the magnet is to hold the water. But the difference between sand and clay is more so how much of that you've got exposed. And so when someone does a moisture measurement and says, oh, it's beyond wilting point, there's a lot of water there, it just means a lot of that is still just bonded to the cation exchange. It doesn't necessarily mean that cation exchange in its own right is any stronger or weaker. It might be, but also might not be. That's where some clays can give up more water and some hold them like there's no tomorrow, okay? But in general, Generally speaking, it's actually got to do with more about the surface area, and so the more organic matter you can make, the higher your water holding potential. Doesn't necessarily mean that the water holding of that organic matter is necessarily stronger or weaker than a clay. Yeah. It's just about surface area more so than intensity. There's, so if you think about, there's there's a slight change in intensity, which has, has effect on how tightly it holds water, but the biggest effect on how much water you got is the surface area of that. Yep. So just here. This is a system where, for example, we're here in June, and at 10 centimetres we see it go up. Once this reaches its full point, so it starts to drain through, we see it, the, the moisture front reach 20 centimetres, and then 30 centimetres, and then it doesn't get down to, to 50 centimetres. Can people sort of see how that we're seeing that water come through? <coughs> The only reason I show this graph is we're seeing the same thing. Can everyone see the water's going through? But here, we're actually quite full, and so we don't see it peak up, but at a depth, we see it slowly creep up as it slowly gets through. The interesting thing about this bit of data here is that this is 22.6. This is only 4.1, and only has a very small um, step. That actually tells us something about the soil structure. We can actually gather from that that that's probably a gravelly layer because it doesn't have a big value and it's not changing much. So we're actually be able to tell things about the soil type just from how water responds in different soils. And similarly, here again, we've got moisture just coming through the profile and, and, uh, and building up at depth, same again. This one here is from a place called Saddleworth, which will go sort of near as you drive south. You notice the moisture is coming through 10, 20 and 30, but at 50 it starts to pool. We've actually got a limey layer there, a very fine line. And um, it pools there, we've really got this subsurface water logging going on. 
Now what happens is that, I'm going to show you how we detect, so we're looking here at how water's getting through the system, we're going to look at next is root systems, is that what we know is that the root system here is struggling to get out moisture and it's it's taking out some moisture here, but once it gets through this limey layer, bang, it really gets stuck into the soil moisture. So it takes a while for the roots to get there, but when it gets through that sort of limey layer, the roots go crazy. And what we've got to manage in this situation with respect to canopy and nitrogen applications and in season is, do we know whether the roots are actually growing in 50 centimetre hydroponic style or are they actually going to have the whole soil profile available to them and being able to have the soil moisture which allows it to bust through this limey layer becomes a key then of whether you're actually growing a crop in 50 centimetres or in a metre.